yeah, yeah. Hello, hello. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here today with Bob Escher, who is really a leader in the hemp industry uh, for building as, as a building material. I'm Myrna James and I'm hosting our um, Her Many Voices Lunch and Learn. And we do this monthly and we certainly have a lot of people joining us live and you might also be watching the replay. So Bob, would you please just introduce yourself? Sure thing. And Marna, this is absolutely wonderful to be here. Uh, from, and it's what's so exciting is it's a different point of view on how to discuss hemp. But my name is Bob Escher. I'm an architect in Dorset, Vermont. I've had my practice Escher design for 33 years now and have um, basically made the transition over to hemp and hemp architecture about four years ago. Uh, when we built the Wonder Workshop with Eric McKee, Left Hand Hemp, out in Denver, uh, which I'll talk about later. But that was the catalyst that took me over to the other side. And I'm loving it. Absolutely loving it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, this, you know, the more I learn about hemp, the more completely intrigued I am with the benefits on many different levels. So we'll, we'll get into that, as you said, um, in a few more minutes down the road here. Uh, we have an hour together, and I know we're going to have some questions toward the end. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey um, as an architect and how you, you know, came to where you are now. But, but you know, tell me some of the history there. Well, you know, it, it's my story is kind of relevant in the sense of my transition. Also, um, you know, my practice has been, like I said, for you know, over 30 years has been in a, in a second home market, a luxury home market. And I followed all the rules, all the um, uh, energy efficiency necessary for buildings, but, you know, wasn't going into the heavy duty um, alternative materials and whatnot. But it all, it, it really started with me to decide to be an architect back when I was uh, really in third, fourth grade. And I want to bring, bring, bring the story up because it's relevant to um, where we end up in this conversation about the past, the present, and the future, okay? Because I, I see myself that way. So I've always been able to draw. That's been the key, okay? And I, I have a, a picture here of something I did in fifth grade of, I call it my Peter Max period, if you will. Um, but it attracted a lot of attention for a little kid. Um, and it took me, you know, to another level with art teachers and we can take that down now, I guess. Um, but what, what, what that did was it put me at a different level with other kids in the, in the classes. Uh, I was able to draw, um, you know, for shows, for, you know, backgrounds, for books and things like that. And remember, this is the sixties, but, but what it did was it opened my eyes to how to communicate through drawings, okay? And it was so important to me to understand that process. And remember, I'm, I'm eight, 10 years old or something. Um, so I figured, you know, in a dimensional level of the, you know, second, two dimensions, three dimensions, I could draw something really cool in two dimensions. And, I could. I, I always wanted to be able to draw in in, in three dimensions. Where I started to learn that, and uh, but the key was I also wanted to walk inside of my drawings, and that's where I got to be an architect. Okay, bottom line is that would be the only way. And a couple of years later, I had one of those moments with you know in junior high with a teacher influence, and he recommended I ta I read um, Flatland which is a very, it's a funny little book, um, but it's all about creatures that live in two dimensions. And they're triangles, they're squares, they're circles, and they can only see in two dimensions. And so this, this is my brain thinking. Um, and then all of a sudden a, a sphere shows up in their world and they can't see it because it's three dimensional. Uh, and so you get all these social issues that we go through today about prejudice, about understanding people, about people that are different than us. 
And it, it really, really influenced me on that. And it started, I started to understand that I could take an idea and put it on paper and communicate. And I'd already decided I was going to be an architect, but I always thought the fourth dimension, and this is where, you know, uh, Apogeo Spatial, your magazine comes in, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, space exploration, you know, the mind and philosophical ways to save the earth. And in my mind, the fourth dimension, which was totally inaccurate, but it was taking a thought, bringing it to my hands and drawing it. Okay, that that process, whatever that was, the fourth dimension was communicating uh, through my head to my hands to the paper. And that sort of gave me the, the final lock on going into architecture. I love that conver this conversation about, um, about the dimensions. Um, and thank you for mentioning apogeospatial. You know, I think 4D also, um, and part of what you're conveying is it is about invisible thoughts and the power of invisible thoughts, right? You were talking about your own thoughts and how you were able to get something different on paper beyond 3D, yeah. right? And that really gets into quantum mechanics and, and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, we actually did an article last year about quantum key distribution in space to transfer data. When you really think about the capabilities of, of 4D and beyond, right, and the quantum world, it, it is mind blowing, right, to think that they can transfer satellite images of the earth, for example, super yeah. high resolution files invisibly, <laughs> invisibly through the air, through quantum mechanics. And also, of course, radio frequency, as they've been doing for all these decades. Um, but it's 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 really interesting. And I love that kind of going a little further into the science of it. Well, it's, um, you know, it's really mind bending, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to ask, that brings up the the famous M.C. Escher. I, I know that when I met you, I was dying to ask about M.C. Escher, especially when you mention mind bending. I think of his famous illustrations and how truly unique they are. Mm -hmm. um, can you share a little bit about about him and your life? Well, yeah. And I, I want to be very clear here. You know, he is not my father, my grandfather, uh, lost cousin or anything like that. Um, but there is a, an indirect relationship. My, we, my family was part, one of the founders of Zurich. And my parents went over in the, the city of the Zurich. City. Yeah, we're, yeah. yeah, we're Swiss. And my parents went over to Europe, to Switzerland, to Zurich, to uh, celebrate the 600th anniversary of our family. And of course, the discussion came up with Uncle Maury. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, it turns out that he, he is part of the family. His family went to Belgium. Uh, when my family, my great grandfather, that that same generation, went to um, America, so um, it's it's an incredible connection, uh, an incredible influence. But I want to be clear: he never sent me a birthday card or anything like that to acknowledge either of our existence. But I'd be naive to say that he didn't influence me because the the way he drew just told me I was absolutely right about the fourth dimension. Uh, you know, that's the bottom line. And right. his in, his influence on that, on another artist, Barry Windsor Smith, who was a, more of a graphic novel artist, uh, very Art Nouveau, very much um, the, the way he drew bodies in fantasy cities, just it, it blew me away on, on that. There was also Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, as an architect, you know, everybody was turned on to him during that period. And there also was a section, uh, R. Crumb, you know, the underground comics of Fritz the Cat. I just love that drawing style. And it, it, <laughs> I had an underground comic strip in college, in fact, because of that. But that's another story. <laughs> uh, but, but that art and that architecture and um, whatnot just really, really pushed me into architecture. And by the time I got to college, which was in, in Florida at Rollins, um, I was studying business administration and economics and really, you know, said, OK, I'm, I'm going to finish here and then went to Texas A&M for architecture school. And and and, and Mernon, that's where they broke me. 
okay? Because I'd always been drawing without a full understanding of drafting, a full understanding of, of vanishing points, uh, of perspective. And in if when I go back to some of my old drawings, you know, the perspective is all out of whack, but it, it was the style of, that mm -hmm. I had. And so it broke me in the sense I had to learn. And this is before computers. Please understand that. This is in the uh, mid 80s. True architectural drawings, literally yeah. before CAD. Yeah, computer aided yeah. design. Yeah, exactly. And and but when I say it broke me, it it didn't destroy me. It it just tr took me to the next level. And it like broke the, you out of a phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and at the same time, learning about architecture and mathematics and you know the physics and stuff, it, it goes back to a book, uh, just coincidentally called um, was it uh, Durable Escher and Bach. And it's quite a tome. It's over six or seven hundred pages, but it's all about how uh, Gerbel was a mathematician. I, I think I'm saying his name right. Escher was an artist and Bach a musician. But they're it's all about math. If you think about it, you know, everything is about math. How music works as an underlying yeah mathematics as an underlying principle. Yes, that really makes all of those things work. Yep. Um, I love that. It to me, it's like the, it's the um, the way the universe. It's like the magic of the universe. Well, yeah. And so what is the Fibonacci? Um, the, the you know the the seashell. You know, uh, everything is is related. Everything is alive, yeah. and that that really pushed me in understanding architecture as a, as a living element, also. So, you know, it, that that's really my journey, and living in Vermont where it's a small state um, and, and an incredible environment. Uh, I understood then where I could find a place for my family as well as my, my practice, but also to find a place to explore. And th the hemp part then comes in four years ago, uh, which is 100% credit to my son, Alex, yeah. who pushed me to bring hemp design and hemp into my practice. So um, before we dive into hemp, which we will do momentarily here, do um, you want to share a little bit about your design theory? Um, or do you think you've already done that? <laughs> I, I think I've, I've said that. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. But but I think that once we get into the hemp part and the future, I, I think there's you'll see sort of a completion of a circle. Great. Okay, great. Yeah, so share more about how you got into hemp. Your, your son, Alex, is now your business partner. Yeah. on the hemp side of your business. And I know you also are one of the founders of the U.S. Um, hemp Building Association. And this is an extremely important uh, group that's advocating right. for uh, the correct laws and things like that. So yeah, how did that start with Alex? Well, it all, it all started that um, he was following, he was a, um, a performing artist in, in New York. Um, off Broadway, he was on Saturday Night Live. He was you know doing a lot of video uh, presentations, but uh, really, there there was a frustration on, uh, you know, what he wanted to do in in business. Okay, and so he started studying about hemp and cannabis, and when he heard about hempcrete, brought it up. And of course, I just said that's crazy. You know, my clients will never go for that. My ba my balance and my uh, practice, but persevered. And he and I went out to NOCO, which is the uh, uh, a big hemp convention out in Colorado and Denver, and it was. Myra, Myra, Myrna, it was all just pure luck and coincidence. Um, I met a good friend, now a good friend, uh, Eric McGee, um, who was looking for an architect, and he was talking to Kelly Thornton and Allie Cloyd of um, Left Hand Hemp about building something. They were teaching, they were teachers for building uh, with hemp. And so Kelly said, well, Eric's looking for an architect, you're looking for a project. And so we ended up the three of four of us working together and we built the wonder workshop and I, I want to put that on the screen please and that is the first permitted hemp crate structure in denver correct correct and that's the rendering that i did for it um and it 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 opened the door to what my life is right now and there's a photograph of it next of after it was built um, and when when was that built it was uh, 2017. Okay. Okay. But um, the, there's another photograph to show of that. 
But but what that did, it was just a small little barn in suburban Denver, 16 by 20, that um, it drew international attention to myself, Eric, and Left Hand Hemp. That's and, great. And for those of you in Colorado or in Denver, that's in the Stapleton neighborhood, right? That's right. That's yep. right. And there's it's a house and there's a neighbor with a fence and then another house, young families, wonderful, wonderful neighborhood. But this is what we built. And um, that's what started my journey because it attracted so much attention for Eric and myself. Um, and that was the catalyst for Eric to form the U.S. Hemp Building Association. He, he gathered 10 of us uh, as the founding members. And that's where we decided we needed to have a an association that represented hemp builders to make the transition from this cottage industry that remember it, most of it was illegal at this time into the construction industry and and but at the same time keeping the utmost respect for all those people that have been doing it for all these years um and remember it's been legal in europe and asia for decades and so we had to catch up um and we're doing it through the association, but it's our goal is you know education, certifications, and um, infrastructure. So that's what was the starting point. And after we returned to Vermont, I put together a portfolio of um, small outbuildings. Okay, uh, I called them the Vermont uh, Post and Beam Hempcrete buildings, and presented them to the governor, Alex and I. And I, I think we can put that up on the screen, just a couple of them. Uh, yeah, the, the goal was to produce these small outbuildings uh, that are not going to be major issues with um, codes and life safety. They're outbuildings. So there's a stable, uh, there's a barn, there's a sugar house, uh, and I think a small um, uh, lake so sort of a pond house studio. And I, I presented presented it to the governor saying let's grow hemp this will help the dairy business this will help vermont let's create a demand so that the farmers can go and know that they can grow industrial hemp instead of cbd and if they're growing then the uh infrastructure will happen because people will say well the farmers have got it we need to process it so we'll get the decortication and from there they'll make the hemp herd and then I'll have all the hemp I need to build my little buildings. And, and so it's sort of a, a working backwards from the top down, but it's a process and it is working. Okay. So how was that received by the governor? Very well. Uh, he's a contractor to start with. Okay. Uh, I think he's, he had a paving company beforehand or something, Governor Scott, but it, it opened the door again. And at the same time, we, with all the national attention that we were getting, you know, we, my goal was to get out there to get really the information out to everybody and then yeah. come back to Vermont too. And I, I'd like to clarify, you mentioned that um, this design for outbuildings was, um, you didn't have to worry about the laws of a residential home about safety, but that's not because hempcrete is unsafe. It's really just, can you explain why you mentioned oh, that? Oh, oh yeah, that's a, thank you. It is, it's it's totally because it's not a certified building material in right. the United States at this point. And that's again where the USHBA is coming in, working with ASTM and ICC to get hemp based materials, hempcrete as such on the counters. It's gonna take a while, you know, but it's moving a lot faster than I thought. Um, and once that's going, um, it, it will be more of a norm. A very, it's it's still an alternative material, but at the same time, those little little buildings uh, are because they're outbuildings. There's not the national and regional and town codes that you have to worry about. There's no not necessarily fire safety or life safety issues, uh, insulation issues. You know, so my goal was to build these buildings so that it can prove that hempcrete is a viable material with little risk in the early days because right, we have to right. be so careful that whatever we build, whether it's me or other builders, or other architects, is with the best material and best design because we can't afford failures in the early stages. 
Right. So, so where residential work is relatively easy, single family homes, you know, commercial and multifamily and institutional is until we have certifications is a challenge. Okay. But when I get a phone call from someone that wants to do a commercial building, I make sure they understand this, but we were able to work out actually on a, a, a project down in Missouri. It's a, it's a 22,000 square foot uh, wedding barn retail complex that um, is a, a typical uh, built building, but it has hempcrete features. And if I could get that picture on. Uh, so, so portions of it are be, will be built in hempcrete. Right. So if you look carefully at, at the top elevation, on the right-hand side is the retail section, and on the left-hand side is the wedding barn. And the lower drawing is the side elevation of the wedding barn. OK, so it's it's meant to hold over 400 people. OK, but going to the top elevation, the gable end of the wedding barn, that is all hempcrete. OK, if you look carefully, the base that wraps around the bottom of the barn, as well as the bottom of the retail area, that's hempcrete patio walls and a, uh, and a foundation base. And going around the, the back of the barn on the lower drawing, there's a big open patio that opens out to the um, the farmland, uh, all hempcrete there. And the goal here, Myrna, was to challenge the codes and say, look, this is normal construction and these are hempcrete features. There's no life safety issues. The gable wall, by nature of construction, is not the structural wall. Um, it's more the, the side walls is what's holding up the building. And patios and sitting walls are not issues, you know, for life safety. Right. But get it out there. Show people that it can be done. I love this term wedding barn. I mean, it just <laughs> totally takes me back to my Kansas roots, right? <laughs> I, I love yeah. it. And um, and so I wanted to clarify as well um, about this project. Yeah. Um this seems like a good time for you to share just briefly or to whatever extent you like uh, the difference between hempcrete and concrete because the term is so similar. I think there might be some market confusion. Oh, yeah, definitely. And just to go back to Apple Ridge Orchard, you know, that's on hold right now because of COVID. Um, and we're, we're putting it out there now as, as an, uh, a discussion. You know, we've had preliminary discussions with the state and the city and they're, they're open to discussing it but obviously COVID shut everything down right now, and that's that's in missouri where is that in missouri in, in sykeston missouri okay. okay so the question about concrete and hempcrete is that you it's like um night and day uh it's a misnomer um it's a pain in the neck but it, it is what it is concrete is concrete structural it's foundations it's building material it's a huge huge polluter hempcrete is non-structural it cannot be used as, as a substitute for concrete. Uh, it cannot be underground uh, because it, it absorbs water. Um, but it, it's a monolithic wall system uh, that is, it looks like concrete. It's, it's a fraction of the weight, but it, it, it's a monolithic wall system that has a stud wall built inside for structure. But there's, there's no... Uh, it's there's no sheetrock, there's no siding, there's no Tyvek, there's no plywood. Um, it's you can do all that to the finished um, uh, hempcrete wall, whether it's poured in place, whether it's sprayed in place, made of block or panels. Um, you can it you end up putting a basically a plaster finish on it. Okay, um, it's it's bug resistant, it's fire resistant, the the values of uh, the R values, depending on the mixes, is as good or better than rock wool, you know, and fiberglass insulation. It doesn't come, I want to be clear, it doesn't come close to the spray and foam. You know, that's got a, a R value of, you know, 50, 60, 70, who knows what, and it's wonderful, but it is the biggest polluter and it's poison. Mm -hmm. Period. Yes, yes. So there's a value of getting rid of that of our lives. But what's happened is it, it's it's 
it's it's it's going to show as we develop this that not only as hempcrete but we can blend the hemp into other materials uh there's been real success with the company uh hemp wood of making a hemp based wood people are making hemp plastics uh hemp fiber to replace carbon fiber it's endless and you know and as we move into the future you 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 won't believe what else is available and out there but it's it's it the bottom line is we need the infrastructure we need the education to tell people that this is not pot it's a buildable uh material and we need the certifications and that's where the ushba is coming in right yeah that's great and and before we dive a little more into the that um so many of the products that you mentioned that can be replaced by hemp are toxic. They're literally toxic, right? Like the plastics, um, as you said, um, the concrete itself, um, it's, it's really, the potential is enormous. And um, it's, I think it's really, really important to, to say we're not just saying it's an, an alternative. It's actually a better alternative in many, many ways. Yes, yes, and, and that's where the education part comes in, and having the certifications is you know absolutely tantamount. But we also have to have the supply, and we need we need thousands and thousands and thousands of acres to build, you know. And it's it's going to take some time, but it is working. Okay. You know, I you're touching on the uh, fact that right now is a huge market opportunity for people who, you know, entrepreneurs or, or farmers or people who really want to do something new and different. Um, and of course, there's going to be challenges and touch and go with laws and, you know, supply and demand and processing plants and all of that. Um, would this be a good time to, could you share with us a little bit history of, about the law? Because I know the 2018 Farm Bill was very important for this. Yeah, yeah. It basically it started with the 2012 I think farm bill with Obama, which opened up the door that universities could now grow and study hemp. Um, since since 2012, um, Mitch McConnell really spearheaded getting hemp into the dialogue. Um, obviously, Kentucky is a, a huge state with that lost a lot with tobacco, and he um, was able to see that there's a possibility of bringing another plant in that could take it. So we have to give him credit, for better or worse, you know, uh, that he is responsible for putting this out there. Uh, when that was part of the farm bill and then Trump um, approved it, it made it so that now farmers could grow hemp. It made it now that farmers could uh, transport it across state lines. Uh, seeds were now available. Um, but it opened the door and took it out of this category one drug of her like heroin and cocaine and which is so stupid because it's not um you know it hemp is cannabis period but it has less than uh, 0.3 thc in it and that is unfortunately a very arbitrary number and it hurts farmers more than anything else because if they grow an acre of hemp let alone 100 acres and suddenly when they harvest it it's over that point three, they have to destroy it. And, and so part of the, the process of acceptance, uh, not only by the governments and the farmers and industry, is insurance for farmers. If, if I've grown 100 acres of hemp and spent you know, the whole season doing that, I have, and I got to burn it, I've lost everything. And I need insurance like they have for corn, like they have for beans, like they have for everything else. Absolutely. Them, that happens. And so the farm bill is the first start and we're finding there's all sorts of hangnails that come with it it's evolution in my mind yeah so yeah it's they, a good working through it it's a good start because at least now they can grow it at, and it's not classified as a as a major drug and they can transfer it in, across state lines and all of that as you said but it, we still have a ways to go right but, yeah um, yeah i'm i'm sure that's really very very difficult to keep the thc less than 0.3 percent um well, it and, has to do with the weather and, know, and as you said it's arbitrary so so mm -hmm. that's a really tricky one um 
There is, a, the if way. I could say more, more, more Myrna, the, um, there is a movement getting that 0.3 up to 1%, uh, which is still very, very low. I, I, I think in order for THC to have an effect on you, it needs to be like 10% or something. So, you know, make the laws so it doesn't hurt the farmers. Yeah, yeah. And at least we're going in the right direction, right? Yes. Yeah, with all of that. That's great. Um, I'd like to ask about, um, you know, I I work with a nonprofit in Panama that's a nature preserve, and they, they actually have a whole division of their um, organization about building with bamboo. Um, and I think some of the benefits are very similar to building yes. with hemp. Um, I'd love to um, connect you with them and, you know, and see if there's potential there to to work with both products. And um, that could become something I'm hoping that could become something that really um, becomes another sustainable building material in the future is the two combined. Yeah, bamboo is wonderful. And it's been around quite a bit. And so we're we're following a lot of that lead, um, how they went through it. Um, so. Yeah, great. Another benefit is for both, I believe, and maybe you can just share a little bit more about this, um, is how easy it is to grow and how quickly it grows um, and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it grows in one season. Okay. Um, where I'm in Vermont, you're in Colorado, you know, that's one season uh, that you can grow and it will replace, you know, thousands and thousands of trees, millions of trees that take, you know, many, many years to grow. And from that uh, material, the harvested uh, material, not only is there uh, the stalk, which is what we need, the interior of the stalk for hempcrete, we need the herd inside, but the fiber can be used, the flower can be used, uh, the biomass, you know, every part of the plant can be used. Um, and, and, and that's part of the key of how it, it's, it, it's a plant, okay? And it, it grows so fast and sometimes two seasons down south or in Central America, uh, two seasons. And it's, it's an endless, endless supply. And we don't have to worry about the, our forests. We don't have to worry about old growth. Um, it's just, it's a weed. <laughs> that's plain and simple. Let's use the weed. Um, and also, we don't need to worry about the arsenic in the seeds, right? Right, right, yeah. Well, because a hemp plant remediates the soil or, or cleanses the soil. It it, uh, it brings, it mm -hmm. absorbs carbon into it, which is what we need for uh, fixing our uh, uh, the global warming. But hemp will remediate poisons out of the soil mm -hmm. also. Uh, they used it uh, for radioactive material. They use it for uh, getting, you know, soils that have been overused with fertilizers. Um, it, it, it not only when it's a plant, but it also absorbs the carbon when it's out of the ground, when it's built as a building. So just imagine that, you know, my little building there, the, the Wonder Workshop, that's a store of carbon inside of it. Okay. That is amazing. I did not realize that. Um, so picture this, a city, picture a city. And this is also a, a huge movement in agriculture as the regenerative agriculture, regenerating the soil um, and knowing that there is soil around the world that is not, doesn't have enough nutrients, right? It doesn't have enough life to actually sustain plants. And so I'm thrilled to know that this is one of the products that can actually cleanse the soil. That's amazing. I didn't realize that. Yeah, soil is, every, it, that's the bottom line of everything. You know, I'm not a farmer. I never paid attention to this stuff in high school, but now I know. Uh, yeah. You, high, you know, soil is the most important part. There's a documentary on Netflix now called Kiss the Ground. If yeah. You haven't, yeah, it's just yeah. beautiful. Um, I think it's narrated by Woody Harrelson, perhaps. And I oh, met yeah. the producers of that at a conference a few years ago. Um, it is a really beautiful movie. I recommend it to everyone um, to check that out. Yeah. Yep. So um, I, I know we're going to be having some questions coming in here in a little bit. I want to invite questions and our producer, Aisela, back in the, who's amazing in the background there. She will be tracking your questions as they come in. Um, Alicia, the founder of Her Many Voices, is 
perhaps on an airplane right now or at the airport, and but she's participating also via chat. Um, so let's keep an eye on that. Um, Alicia, keep your comments coming. Um, okay, so do we want to talk about the future yet, or should we keep? Should we dive a little bit more into? Is there anything else you'd like to share, really, about about, about the what you're doing now? No, I, I think we've covered, you know, what the past has done, what where we are in the present, and you know, what's the future? I mean, that's the key. We got to save the earth here, uh, and I'm convinced that this plant is, you know, number number one is the, you know, material the green industry has been waiting for, okay, and and that's just in construction, okay. Um, but the future, who knows where that's going? And, you know, I'm right now I'm the director of the materials committee with the USHBA. And instead of talking about nuts and bolts about, you know, let's do hemp wood or let's do hemp plastics, you know, we'll, we'll do all that. But I wanted to, I want to take that committee and this and the people with it to another level. Okay. And to think about the future, because you know we got enough work to do right now, but we can't ignore it. And what was amazing is there was a, a total coincidence. That, and again, my son Alex ties into this uh, incredibly. He and a friend, um, a, la a lady named Kamali um, Basu, who is from India, uh, she she has a degree in architecture from a university in, uh, in India, and then a, a master's degree from the University of Houston in space architecture. And when I met her, you know, that just really blew my mind. I mean, talk about mind-bending MC Escher, you know, I, I, this was right, right there with it. Um, because in her classes in Houston and NASA and her connections there, um, they were really studying how to design you know, space stations, habitation on planets. And the two of them put together this sort of, I, I it was a paper, but I call it a manifesto. It had such a effect on me um, of how to bring hemp into this world and into the future. And, and into oh, space, literally into the, space. the world of space. Right. And, and they wrote this statement, two statements, and one of them is, part of my title today, um, but it really blew me away um, that solving the, I'm reading this, and this is credited to Tamily and, and Alex, solving this engineering agricultural bottleneck, meaning space farming, would spark a scientific migratory and cultural renaissance for centuries, okay? Now, centuries. Yeah, okay. centuries. You know, I would really love for you to mention their last names as well if you want to. Um, oh, what's that? Mention their last names as well, oh. if you want to, for proper yeah. credit. Oh yeah, it's it's Tamily uh, uh, Basu and Alex Escher. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that is incredible, right? It's it's really that's the potential of of this product, um, and you know it's it's such a it's a shame that it's been illegal for so long in this country. Um, but I think maybe the time is coming. And again, I love the market opportunity that really is now. Right, right. It? It's, it's right. really now is the time. Um, there's but it's, a also, it's, it's also, um, you know, the fact that we're thinking about outer space, whether it's on a space station or on a planet or a moon or something. Um, and, and this ties into a conversation with the materials committee is that, um, you know, the necessary human needs of food, clothing, and shelter is with a hemp plant, okay? You you grow hemp, you have clothing, you grow hemp, you have food, you grow hemp, you have hempcrete and other building materials. So why not figure a way to do that? Uh, there's all sorts of challenges, obviously, that I have no clue about building in, in space from radiation to gravity to water, you know, and evidently I, I did check uh, NASA is and outer space, other other um, exploratory companies, they're exploring water from asteroids. I mean, there's asteroids everywhere. 
and they're looking at asteroids to be able to mine for water. And if that's the case, all we need is a couple of hemp seeds and some lime and we're, we're, we're golden. <laughs> yeah, you are suggesting growing hemp on Mars or on the moon or somewhere else where where it could provide that for future civilizations. I, you know, suggesting is a pretty serious word. <laughs> I'm dreaming, okay, at this point. And okay. it is, and we recognize it's audacious, and I got to love that. That's great. Right. But, you know, another another point that the two of them made, I think, is so important, I'd like to read, is uh, to, to demonstrate industrial hemp's potential as a core raw material for permanent and sustainable colonization of other planets, moons, et cetera. Colonization, okay? Right. It, maybe it'll work. Yeah. I think it will. Well, I hopefully we're planting some seeds here as well, right? With um, with the community of people with uh, in my audience with the magazine. Yes. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate that. We do have some questions here. Um, one of them is, um, well, someone wants to say they loved meeting you at. Oh yeah, Tommy. Yes, That's I remember great. definitely. Yep. Great that Tommy's on live. Wonderful. And um, he's part. He's part of you know the her many voices and uh, what Alicia and and her company of, or foundation have done is just fabulous. Great. And Tommy's Tommy's an amazing artist too. Out in Hawaii. Great. So people talk about hemp like it's a miracle plant, and it sometimes might feels too good to be true. Does it actually live up to its promises? And also, what are some limitations? First answer is, it is a miracle plant, my opinion, okay? I've never seen anything like this. I've been bombarded for 30 years from products who say they're the latest green material, the latest, uh, the most energy efficient. And they're basically, yeah, they're better than the other ones. There's no question about it, but it's be basically just another uh, material on the market to make money and yeah, we need it. We need it. But um, hemp is hemp has got the answers in my mind, um, as well as the future exploration, even as a um, for electricity and battery storage. OK, so oh not God. only is the Wonder Workshop storing you know, all this carbon, it's also in the future. You can plug your phone into it because it will be able to hold a charge. Oh, That's my it. God. It's in the works, in the works. Right. Um, the limitations, I think, uh, right now, from the building point of view, is uh, we need, obviously, the infrastructure put together. Um, we need the certifications. But the most efficient way to build is going to be with block or panels, OK? The way that we built the Wonder Workshop, the way that a lot of these buildings are done historically have been poured in place, like concrete in forms. Or there's new new um, new technology that uh, uh, Cameron McIntosh and many others in in America and from Europe of spraying it. Okay, but it's still the 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 pouring in place is very labor labor intensive and imperfect. Okay, because it it takes time to dry. You have different people doing it. Where if you can make these panels or blocks in a factory like they're doing, and just starting in America. Yeah, you know, that's the way to build through modular home systems. Oh, I can't. Your your mute's on. It sounds like the uh, limitations are purely administrative and um, that kind of thing. It's really not limitations within the plant itself. Right, but there's but let's let's be honest here. You know, there's a lot of political issues. There's a lot of uh, money issues, investments. There's uh, you, we're, we're not competition. You know, people think that we're going to put concrete and, you know, in, you know, insulation companies out of business. No, no, no. We'll blend. That's a we'll great blend point. with them yeah. and, and, and help them get their R values up, but also get their, um, you know, carbon footprint down. That's a really great point. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, people are wondering how to get involved. Watch more videos like this, <laughs> but but honestly, do do the research. Uh, there's so many videos now on on YouTube on this. 
uh, look at the USHBA. If, if you're in building, if you're in construction, uh, if you're an architect, engineer, interior designer, insulator, plaster guy, you know, anything, we, we can find a home for you. And uh, we're setting up these regional um, uh, areas of, of America for groups of, of being able to teach, uh, finding a, net, a network. So if people want to build or we can tell them there's one in Kentucky, there's one in Idaho, et cetera. Oh, that's great. That's great. Could you share some more of those regions, Kentucky and Idaho? And are there yeah, other specific it's, ones? I, there are eight regions. And I think if you go on our website, which is ushba.org, uh, there's a map. Okay. I know the Northeast is the um, region eight, and it starts out in Oregon, uh, Washington. You know, that I think is region one. But the best thing is to go to USHBA. Great. great, great, great. That's wonderful. I mean, if you're, if as far as getting involved, if you're a farmer, you could convert some of your land to hemp. If you're a true entrepreneur, you could start a processing plant. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be done to um, to really maximize this this industry and the potential for the conversion. Right there, there's a there's a huge. Um, the potential is so enormous because as you're they're adding these positive benefits of hemp, you're also taking out the toxic problems of the products that it's replacing. Um, and so, you know, you talked about the how concrete and also the spray and foam, those are pollutants and they're, they're literally poison. And I mean, there's just such incredible potential. Um, so there's a lot of ways to get involved. Um, We've had a previous interview with Cheryl, as you know, and um, that video is really a great one to watch if you're thinking about the legal side of the industry. Right. She's an advocate on that side as well. Um, and I kind of imagine we'll have a few more interviews on this topic. <laughs> yeah, Cheryl put it really well. Uh, a, a number of months ago, we were talking about this and she, the way she put it was that, um, hemp is in an era of restoration i believe it was the word because it was it's been illegal for so long but everybody knew the what it could do and so we're restoring it back to its uh glory and it's right. going to take time it's going to take time for sure yeah that's wonderful um here's a note um with lumber increasingly unaffordable for the average builder um how do you envision the transition to more hemp centric solutions how would such a shift in materials change the form and function of construction styles uh you know that's a pretty good question and it's topical uh COVID has blown away my world as far as um my my day job as an architect people are migrating to vermont for the safety environment the safe environment that it represents coming out of the cities uh the northeast uh lumber prices are out of out of this world material prices whether you're you're getting um plywood or um a, even a, even a hood for a stove i had to wait six months for a simple stove hood um and of course the 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 impact it has on schedules, on labor. It's its a, a major, major issue what COVID's going through. But, you know, hemp is not, it, it's kind of interesting. I've had this question before because lumber is so expensive. Now hemp is much more reasonable. And I, I think that, you know, the prices are going to go down as we get through this pandemic. But I, I don't want to mislead people to think that, you know, hemp is a bargain or hemp is very expensive. There's so much, Myrna, that has to deal with what is the mixer? What, where is your environment? Are you growing in Idaho or are you building in Vermont or are you building in, uh, in South America? You know, there's so many factors that we're working through to try to figure out what that baseline would be. It's the same question of how many acres it takes to build, you know, a house mm -hmm. of hemp. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no real answer to that. There's a generic answer, but it depends where you are. It depends, depends on a lot of different factors, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And, and we're working on that at the USHBA to, to get some basis, okay, to start with. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's coming. And it, again, this is a, we're not infants anymore. We're toddlers. Okay. Okay. This, yeah. This, yeah. This, this That's a nice analogy. 
yeah, we're the, the industry is, is we're starting this from scratch. Uh, so, you know, we have to be patient and we have to be ready for the ups and downs that are going to happen no matter what. Um, and just be consistent in knowing that we hold the answer to the future. We're building a new industry. We're building a new design genre. And, you know, we need to get the carbon footprint of construction materials down. Yeah. And the AIA was very, very specific to its membership that it has to start with us because we're the guys that are specifying the stuff. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you, you've you been working with directly with the, the AIA, right? The American Institute of Architects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my goal is, you know, I've, I've spoken uh, with Jennifer Martin from Hemstone at a, a very really, really good expo for the Wisconsin uh, AIA and Illinois AIA. And, um, you know, my goal is to get to national, okay, step by step. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's great. Uh, Tommy has a question about, um, here it is. What about some of the problems with high volumes of hemp being harvested, but rotting because of the lack of the processing materials? And do you have any ideas about fixing that? You know, it, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, it's, it's basically supply chain issues. Okay. It's basically, uh, people jumping into this for all the right reasons, but not having the infrastructure ready for their harvest. And it kills me. It kills me to see this issue come up and it's happening in Vermont, Colorado, you know, California. Um, there, there is biomass to be used for, uh, all sorts of areas, but it's not making it affordable for the farmers. To, to grow. You know, if they got a barn full of stuff left over from last year, they're thinking twice about doing it again. And that's where we got to get that education going. Um, and, and very much as a, a really good point is on the education part where I, I, when Alex mentioned to me about my, you know, practice bringing this in and I balked at my client base, I realized that I have two worlds that I'm living in. There's my architectural world that I have here in Vermont, and I have the hemp world that is uh, grown into my practice. And what I say to the people in 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 my my architectural practice about hemp, where the the first impression of hemp, you know, Bob's gone to pot, you know, forget it. No, 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 no. Uh, guys, you guys were children of the '60s, right? And didn't you guys? Aren't you the ones that said, "Save the Earth"? Okay, but you got a little busy with life and marriage and business. Now it's the the uh, the level of or the um, generation of my son and younger that are pushing this because they have no choice. They have to save the earth. And, and your your typical clients with your architecture are really um, they're they're very successful people. They're luxury high end homes, sometimes mm -hmm. second homes, right? Oh yeah, but but to be clear, I I do you know for local people. I've, I've renovated, you know, mobile homes. I've done things of all different sizes. So, uh, you know, you have to be pretty diverse up here in Vermont. Okay. So, so understanding to how to tell these people that their children in the sixties at the same time to tell the, the cottage industry people that have been growing hemp underground in, in, you know, in this for many years, uh, you know, oh, we don't want to get involved with big, big business or you're the man you know, you know, the suits and stuff. And, and I said, all I look, I'm an art, just an architect, but all I think about is life safety. And so life safety, children of the sixties, that's where I meld them together. You're yeah. You're a bridge builder. You know, you're, you're in a really important um, position because you understand both worlds and see the benefits and the, the positive sides of both worlds. So you can build that bridge. Yes. True. Very true. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. Uh, here's another question. Do you eventually see standard construction companies changing to hemp or do you think in 50 years we'll have both? Oh, they're changing now. Yeah. You know, step by step, baby steps. Um, you know, a lot of people are watching, you know, what's happened over the last couple of years, the successes and failures. Um, there will be specialists in hemp construction and I'm sure larger companies will eventually branch into, you know, an area with building with hemp. It's we got to, the thing is we just got to get the stuff on the shelves. Yeah. Well, but will will there be both in fifty years? 
Oh yeah, I'm sure yeah. there will be. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully in ten years. Right, right. That's that's a good point. <laughs> Let's see. I would like to do another call for any more questions. Um, I am just checking our chats here to see what we have going on. Um, we have a few more minutes. I'd love for you to think, Bob, about what else you want to share. Um, if there's anything we didn't cover, you know, would you like to share anything else um, in, the, in our last few minutes here? You know, it's basically just education. Get out there and learn about it. And it, it doesn't have to be for construction, okay? But, you know, that's my specialty. And I want to emphasize that, you know, as we're talking today, you know, about the past, present, and the future on, on Mars or who, who knows where. Um, but but there's, there's fabrics. There's, there's um, structural cable. There's electronics. Every, every industry can have hemp in it. Anything that's made of petroleum, plastic, or cotton can be replaced with hemp. Oh, wow. Okay. And, you know, people say there are 25,000 uses for hemp. You know, okay, I don't have time to go through the list. Yeah, right. But there's, I'm sure there's more. Okay. And we're discovering everything, new things every day. It's really exciting. It really is. And if people have questions, please reach out to me or the USHBA. Um, I think there's a, at the end of this, there'll be a card that will um, have my address and whatnot. And I can direct you to the people of, uh, that can answer your questions. That's the best part, Myrna, is that the network we've created just in three short years, two short years, if that, no, eh, two and a half, uh, it is amazing and it includes farmers it includes contractors it includes investors bankers you know it and our goal is to get that network locked together yeah that's amazing you know we have a note here from alicia who is unable to log on um and she just really wants to thank you bob for coming on the show she said she wished she could be here with us but the tech gods had something else in mind um, but she's been watching She's mm -hmm. very grateful to you for sharing your experience, thoughts, feelings, and visions for this beautiful plant medicine. Hemp will make a healthy change for our globe and is the perfect plant to use as we travel beyond our own global limits as we enter the space age. And I think when she says plant medicine, she's talking about for the earth. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. So listen, that's beautiful. Her many voices is just, you know, inspired me in so many ways and and directly thank you to alicia because of that you know it, it's a way of thinking uh it's a bridge if you will for me uh to understand her way of thinking uh, and what she's done for women around the world and what she's doing for haiti and you know other countries uh and really putting so much energy into him through the foundation is just mind-blowing it's really, and it's also my privilege to be here representing her many voices. Really a privilege. Thank you so much, Bob. I really love this, and we'll talk to you very soon. Um, it's wonderful. I think we've got some perfect timing here, and yeah, thanks again. Okay, thank you.